Introducing Andrew, uh, Andrew Andrew Doyle. He's a broadcaster. Many of you might have seen him on GB News. He pre uh, presents a particularly brilliant show uh, every Sunday night called Free Speech Nation, which if you've never watched it, uh, you should uh, bookmark that show on, 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 on Sunday night. He's the author of uh, this very interesting new book called The New Puritans. It's cheaper than Piers' yeah, book, yeah, so you yeah. can uh, you can buy this one fairly easily from the local bookstore. Probably, <laughs> probably in Waterstones or something, I'd yeah, imagine. Is, no. you know, yeah. um, and Andrew is uh, all sorts of other things. He's a comedian, he's a writer of musicals, he's an expert in Renaissance poetry, and, and so many things that uh, uh, you probably don't know about him. Um, Andrew, do you want to... Uh, to give us uh, some idea about John Milton and yes. Liberty. Uh, yes, I would. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, thank you to Arif for organising this wonderful event. And thank you for all turning up. I really appreciate it. I'm going to start by uh, talking about... Do you, are you familiar with the Barbican estate? You're familiar with how ugly it is. <laughs> so the Barbican estate is in London. And I used to teach there. I used to teach at a school called the City of London School for Girls. And uh, I used to teach Milton. I used to teach Paradise Lost. And for the first lesson uh, of the series uh, with the A-level students, I made a point of taking them out of the building because in the middle of the Barbican, uh, there's this uh, medieval church, a Gothic medieval church. It's hugely incongruous in the middle of this brutalist architecture. And this is uh, St. Charles Cripplegate. Uh, and it's a fascinating little church and no one goes there and the tourists don't really go there and they should because it has this incredible history. I mean, Shakespeare lived around the corner. Some people speculate he might have gone there. Um, uh, John Fox is buried there. Oliver Cromwell was married there. Uh, John Bunyan uh, went there. So all sorts of reasons to go there. But the reason I took my students there is because it's the burial place of John Milton. Uh, and this is very interesting because, of course, John Milton, as you know, Paradise Lost, greatest English epic, arguably, alongside the Fairy Queen, um, is buried there. Surely he should be buried in Westminster Abbey. Surely he would have a place at Poet's Corner. Uh, but he doesn't. And uh, you probably know why he doesn't. We don't actually know where he's buried in this, in this church, by the way. There's a plaque that says John Milton is buried near here, and they don't quite know. Um, it's very unassuming. It's just a little, a little engraving. Nothing like... There is a memorial, by the way, in, in, in Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey, which is a lot more elaborate. That was erected in 1737. Um, but in this small, little, humble church, there's nothing. And, of course, the reason for this is his uh, republicanism. Quite simply, he was on the side of Oliver Cromwell. He was a Puritan uh, and he wrote in support of regicide uh, after um, the trial and execution of Charles I. And all of this means that, you know, by the time uh, the restoration happens in 1660, he's a marked man. He's in a lot of, lot of trouble. Uh, because he wasn't involved in the actual trial and execution of Charles I, uh, he, he's saved. Uh, but he did spend some time in the Tower of London. He was constantly paranoid that he was going to get assassinated. And in fact, the only reason he escaped with his life is because of Andrew Marvell, another poet, uh, because Marvell pointed out, you know, he's, he's old, he's blind, he's knackered, he's not a threat anymore. And that's what saved him. Uh, but that's also why he's buried in this little church. But there's a very interesting story about the church. And have any of you been there to St. Giles Cribblegate? It's, it's, it's a really interesting, if you go in there and you see where he, near, he, he's sort of nearly buried here, um, there aren't any, any, really many details, but something really in interesting happened in 1790 where uh, they were renovating the church and a group of souvenir hunters dug his body up and mutilated it and pulled bits of his hair off and his teeth out, bits of his jaw, uh, just smashed it up. Uh, I think partly it's the day, if you think about it, 1790, so you're around the time of the French Revolution, there was a lot of anti-Republican sentiment at the time. That would explain it. They were also probably out to make some money. And he was completely desecrated. Um, and uh, William, William Cooper, the poet, was so horrified by this, he actually wrote a poem called Stanzas on the Late Indecent Liberties Taken with the Remains of the Great Milton. But it does make me think about the fate of heretics because they're often shunned in their lifetime. Milton's a very good example of this. Uh, and he's someone who devoted his whole life to poetry. And he had this very clear sense, even from an early age, even from the early 20s. He sort of knew that he was going to be this important, great poet for the nation. And he wanted to sort of rehabilitate uh, the notion, notion of English verse. This is why, you know, Paradise Lost, this great epic, uh, isn't written in uh, Latin or Italian. It's written in English, in blank verse. It was very different to what people were used to at the time. Uh, and he, he was sure he had this destiny, and he's sure he was being guided by God. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting things about Paradise Lost is Milton claimed that it was mostly composed in a dream, in dreams, in a sequence of dreams, uh, a bit like Kubla Khan, the Coleridge poem. So Milton would wake up, he would have a whole bunch of lines in his head, and he would dictate them to his wife, and, and then he would refine them after that. So make of that what you will. I don't know if I believe it, but it's an interesting idea. 
Um, but, but he wasn't just in service to his God and to his muse. He was also essentially political. And if you think about the time he was living through, it was turbulent and it was, it was fascinating. So he's born 1608. So, you know, ju- he, you know Shakespeare's still alive, just he's got another eight years to go. Uh, he's, he's, he's living through the Civil War, uh, trial and execution of Charles, uh, the Restoration, the Great Plague, uh, the Great Fire of London. All of this is happening, has massive ramifications. You know, the first edition of Paradise Lost is out in 1667, so that's a year after the Great Fire of London. That even affects the distribution and publication of this text. So a massive upheaval. He, he goes blind around the sort of late uh, 1650s as well. There's a lot of, a lot of his work it, uh, deals with this idea of blindness. Paradise Lost comes after this. Samson Agonistes, you might know his uh, tragedy, which reads like a play, but it's not a play. Um, uh, deal with this notion of, of blindness. Uh, and he wrote some very beautiful poetry about it. Um, but the thing I think, and he also wrote lots of tracts about divorce. He was very interested in the right to get divorced. Didn't like his wife. <laughs> well, he didn't at first, and they, they were estranged, and then they got back together later on, because, you know, you've, you've seen that the grass isn't always greener, and you sort of ma- you make do, don't you? Um, you're not there yet, you're too young. So, but Areopagitica is really interesting. He wrote this tract called Areopagitica, which was a, this was in... <laughs> Uh, 1644. And this was a response to the licensing order of 1643. And this was an order uh, by which he, um, all printed texts would have to pass before a censor. So really, Areopagitica is uh, the foundational text of the defense of freedom of the press. And it's really, really important. Um, and I think it's a fantastic piece of work. And, and it, it really resonates in a lot of the things that happen today. I should say that I think it's very easy to dismiss Milton, as a hypocrite, uh, he didn't like Catholics. He wouldn't extend freedom of speech to Catholics. Um, I would, I'm, a, I'm here, I'm a Catholic, I'm here defending him. He wouldn't like that. Uh, he, uh, there are reasons for that though. There, he saw Catholicism as a kind of tyranny in, of, in and of itself, something that was there to suppress liberty. So there's a reason why he would, he would think that. And you have to put it in the context of his time. Um, but also we need to understand that when we're talking about his uh, exploration of the ideas of of liberal values and free speech, uh, he has a very different conceptualization of liberty than we do. His is a very sort of Christian idea of liberty. And it is very much, it's not the idea that you can just do what you like. That's not what he means by it. That's, he had a word for that, he called that license. And he saw that, so this distinction between license and liberty being very, very different. So it's not that you can do what you like. Liberty is, is, is all about uh, kind of gu- guarding against, the, purging yourself of those sort of urges and lusts and baser instincts to have effective self-governance, if that makes sense. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the thread that runs through all of his work is the idea of individual thought. Piers mentioned conscience. It's so key to everything that he writes. And there's a kind of paradox here because, you know, we often see him as aligned with the Puritans. He was attracted to the idea of Oliver Cromwell because he believed in meritocracy. He, 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 was, he was completely grounded by the notion of reason. So for him, the idea of a monarch, someone who is is the ruler by an accident of birth, was unreasonable. Uh, th- these, are, these are radical ideas. But as I say, uh, to get back to this idea of, of this paradox, if you're a Puritan, and if you, one of the main aspects of Puritan thought is the idea of, of the Calvinist idea of predestination, the idea that people don't know if they are elect or if they are damned and they can never know. And in other words, uh, people are sort of going along a predetermined line. And he hated that idea really hated it. And if you think about Paradise Lost, which I'm assuming most of you've read, in Paradise Lost, of course, Adam and Eve, it has to be their choice to eat the forbidden fruit. It has to be. Because otherwise, what's the point? It means that their faith in God is, is nothing. They're just marionettes. And that's why he keeps coming back to this idea of individualism uh, and individual values and individual liberty. And that's the key thing that Areopagitica is about. Just as Adam and Eve need to take their own responsibility, they've eaten the fruit, right? They've made that choice we should have the choice to read whatever we want to read. However bad or pernicious those ideas are, if you have someone censoring work for you, then you are depriving someone of that individual autonomy. And that is something that he absolutely hated. There are all sorts of things in Areopagitica, which I would urge you to read, uh, that really elegantly express these ideas of individual... Like passages of it spring to mind whenever various news stories happen today. I, I, I think about this whenever I see those viral TikTok videos of people burning J.K. Rowling's books. Have you seen these sort of, you know, these, these mad activists um, setting fire to Harry Potter books and, and, and sort of doing a dance and then doing a lecture about how evil she is. <laughs> and you watch that and you just think, uh, 
there's something quite... The burning of books feels like a repudiation of all that civilization has achieved. There's something quite visceral about it. I mean, you can say it's just a book, it doesn't matter. But the symbolism of it is quite vile, actually. I think about what happened to Salman Rushdie. Not recently, the horrible attack that happened recently, but if you go back to 1989, you're probably too young to remember, but in 1989, uh, there were these protests on the street of Bradford, and people were burning his book, burning the satanic verses. And he wrote about this in a brilliant memoir he wrote called Joseph Anton. And he said that the sight of his book being crucified and then immolated left him with the sense that, quote, now the victory of the Enlightenment was looking temporary, reversible. And, of course, you think of the, the, the Pathé News footage of the Open Platz in Berlin, what's now called the Babel Platz in Berlin. If you go there, I was there quite recently. There's all that. You've seen the old footage of Goebbels calling on all the students and the students and the, and the, the Nazis there casually throwing these books onto the fire. And if you go there now, there's a plaque in the middle of the Babel Platz uh, with a quotation from Heinrich Hein. And it says, where they burn books, they will in the end burn people too. And I think that's a really powerful sentiment. And I think it's right. You know, uh, did you read about this story last September? Uh, it, there was a, a school board in Ontario, uh, which was in charge of 30 odd elementary secondary schools. And they uh, determined that a number of the books in the libraries were problematic. That's the word they always use. Um, because they had outdated, outdated racial stereotypes. And they removed up to 5,000 books uh, from these various libraries. And they burnt a lot of them. And not only that, they burnt them and they called it a flame purification ceremony. Now, if you don't know how dystopian that is, then you need to read a little more. It's absolutely terrifying. They clearly don't know the implications of their own actions. They even used some of the ashes to fertilize a tree as though this was something really beautiful and progressive. It's so blind. Um, and in Areopagitica, Milton compares the destruction of books to a form of homicide. And this is what he says, quote, whereof the execution ends not in the slaying of an elemental life, but strikes at that ethereal and fifth essence the breath of reason itself. You are slaying an immortality rather than a life. Elsewhere in the text, he writes, who kills a man kills a reasonable creature, God's image. But he who destroys a good book kills reason itself. Now, he also makes the case that censorship can start with good intentions. You know, there are certain sentiments that everyone in this room will agree are beyond the pale. Um, and this has given rise to, as we've seen and has, uh, has already been alluded to, the various hate speech laws that we have across this uh, in, in our country, which in our country are enacted in the Communications Act and the Public Order Act. But look across Europe. There's a really good book by Paul Coleman called Censored, which just provides a facsimile of all the major hate speech laws across Europe. Ireland just recently uh, initiated new hate speech laws. Our current government, our current Tory government is attempting to push through their online safety bill. This is a new form of hate speech legislation. One of the reasons, and looking at Paul Coleman's book, it becomes very clear why this is so dangerous. And the reason is that nobody can agree on what hate speech means. All of the legislation is different in one way or another. The Communications Act in this country from 2003, uh, specifically at section 127, says that if you post something online, words that are, quote, grossly offensive, that can land you in jail. Well, what does that mean? What's the difference between offensive and grossly offensive? And how can we possibly trust anyone in a position of power to make that determination? It's really troubling. Because if I were in power, I would find someone criticizing my power to be grossly offensive. And if I'm the one who's wielding the power, what happens then? So I think hate speech as a concept should be abandoned. I think the whole thing is hugely dangerous and is obviously open to exploitation because people in power will assume hate, or at least characterize as hate, anyone who challenges them. And as Milton puts it in Areopagitica, Arab he says, censors do not stay in matters heretical, but any subject that is not to their palate. That's the point he's making here. What if the person who, gets to who is deciding on what constitutes hate is wrong? We had an example here last week. We had Helen Joyce, a very eminent journalist, come and give a talk, and at, here at Gonville and Keys, and the master and senior tutor wrote a joint email to staff and students, you probably received it, making the claim that Helen Joyce held views that were, and I want to get this right, offensive, insulting, and hateful. Now, they're entitled to their opinion, but this, of course, is a grotesque mischaracterization of her position. Have they read her book? Have they listened to what she's got to say? If they have, they haven't been listening very carefully. And this is a problem. I also consider it a kind of uh, abuse of power to send that email through the university channels, knowing that very few of you are going to reply and challenge it.
it's a problem. And it's particularly a problem because universities need to be a place where we can discuss matters openly, where the views are not, where outside speakers are not attacked, and let's say, let's face it, defamed uh, in that way. And this, of course, is one of the major barriers to open dialogue in this sensorial age of ours. So too often, people are interpreting the views of those they disagree with in the most uncharitable possible way. And you hear this all the time. When feminists say that they are concerned about the potential threat to women's rights when you abandon single-sex spaces, they're not being hateful, they're not being transphobic, they're not attempting to erase anyone's existence. How often have you heard that phrase? People trying to erase my existence. No one is trying to do that. No one. And it, it is a kind of hysteria. It is a kind of, uh, it is, it, well, at least it's incredibly uncharitable. So what you end up with is people are essentially fighting against figments of their imagination. And this is a point that Milton expresses in Areopagitica. He says, if you sanction censorship, if you give people that power, how, can you do, how do you know that those censors are correct, that they're not fighting with figments of their own imagination? He writes, how shall the licenses themselves be confided in unless we can confer upon them or they assume to themselves above all others in this land the grace of infallibility and uncorruptedness. Five minutes. So John Stuart Mill makes a similar point in On Liberty. He says, all silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. And even if some views are categorically wrong, even if that could be proven, silencing them will only guarantee their perpetuation. And we see this again and again. We see it in the Streisand effect. Uh, you, you know that phrase? That's where, that comes from when Barbara Streisand tried to prevent a photographer from publishing an image of her Malibu beach house. And by doing so, everyone drew so much attention to it, everyone suddenly knew where her beach house was. <coughs> the Streisand effect is, we see it again and again. And I think the reason people do this, people who support censorship, people who support no platforming, they bought into the idea that the, pub, the, the, the communication of ideas that they disagree with, or even toxic ideas, uh, will enable them to spread like an airborne virus, and therefore we need to keep them contained. And the history of censorship shows us the opposite is true. That sunlight is the best disinfectant. That's the, the cliche, but there's truth to it. And Milton envisages this as a battlefield. He says, uh, he says, he imagines truth and falsehood as the antagonist. He says, let her and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. We're far better placed to know and overcome evil and true hatred if we are acquainted with its way of thinking. That's the idea there. So I'm just going to finish. I've got just a couple of minutes. I want to talk about this, uh, one of Milton's own anecdotes. So about halfway through Areopagitica, he talks about meeting Galileo. So in the early, no, it would have been the late 40s, late 16, no, late 1630s, he went on a grand tour, kind of trip of Europe. And he visited Galileo, who at that time was under house arrest by the Inquisition uh, for his heretical views. You know, he'd bought into the uh, Copernican theory of the Earth moving around the sun. And he was right. Uh, as you know. And so Milton visits Galileo. And by this point, Galileo is sort of in the condition that Milton will one day end up in. Milton's this young, you know, in, uh, very, full of passion, full of vigor, got his whole life ahead of him, thinks he's going to be this great poet, which he was. But he ends his life in the same way Galileo does, blind, uh, publicly shamed, uh, basically just sit by himself, uh, rotting away effectively. And he visits him, he writes about the crime in Areopagitica. He says, the crime was thinking in astronomy otherwise than the Franciscan and Dominican licenses thought. So, actually, Gil, uh, Galileo is the only contemporary of Milton that, that gets a mention in Paradise Lost. If you remember the first book of Paradise Lost, and Satan is striding across the fiery plains of hell, and uh, there is a direct allusion uh, to Galileo within that. He says... Uh, he, he compares his spear to the tallest pine hewn on Norwegian hills and his shield to the moon whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views. That's Galileo with the telescope that he had uh, famously modified. Now, this is the key point, I think, and I will end on this. From the perspective of the religious dogmatists of the time, Galileo's words were hate speech. If there had been, well, there were <laughs> hate speech laws in place at the time. That is why he was under house arrest by the Inquisition. It was, it's the same principle. And this reminds us, I think, that any measures to curb offensive speech will some, at some point be exploited by the powerful 
to silence dissent. You're setting a terrible precedent. You are laying the groundwork for future tyranny if you grant people the power to silence those they disagree with. And moreover, the defense of freedom of speech is our most effective guarantee of equal rights for marginalized groups. It's the only way to see bad ideas refuted. So not every, every heretic is a Galileo, of course. But once we compromise on the principle of free speech, the Galileos of this world will suffer as much as the trolls. That's all I've got to say. Brilliant.